Go ahead. I'm not sure about the president. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Drew Von Bergen of United Press International, the president of the National Press Club. <clears throat> At this time, I would also like to welcome those listening to today's speaker's luncheon on the National Public Radio Network and those viewing the proceedings live on the Cable Satellite Public Affairs Network. A few reminders of some upcoming luncheons at the Press Club, both luncheons and newsmaker breakfasts of some interest. On Thursday, October the 16th, our luncheon speaker will be the Reverend Jerry Falwell, head of Moral Majority. <laughs> then, then next Monday, October 20th, we have a newsmaker breakfast featuring libertarian presidential candidate Ed Clark, followed at noon by our annual NPC Consumer Awards and Regional Awards luncheon featuring Bess Meyerson, the former Miss America and unsuccessful candidate for the Senate in New York. Two more items of special interest to uh, political reporters. On Wednesday, October the 22nd, independent presidential candidate John Anderson will appear at a press club luncheon. And the next morning, Thursday, October the 23rd, Citizens Party presidential candidate Barry Commoner will appear at a newsmaker breakfast. Please fill in these cards at your table uh, with questions for today's speaker. We have only a short time for questions, at, but I will try to ask as many as possible. At this time, I would like to introduce the head table from left to right. First, Mr. Ray Jenkins, special assistant to the president. <clears throat> Ms. Josette Sheeran of New York News World, Chairman of the Press Club Newsmaker Breakfast Committee. <laughs> Mr. Robert Russell of the Council on Wage and Price Stability. <laughs> Mr. Frank Ockefer of the Milwaukee Journal, former president of the Press Club. <laughs> Frank is also now president of the National Press Foundation. Mr. Joseph Layton, Assistant Secretary of Treasury for Public Affairs. <laughs> Mr. Joseph Slevin, Vice President of the Press Club and Editor of Washington Bond Report. <laughs> Secretary G. William Miller, Secretary of Treasury. <laughs> Mr. Peter Holmes of the Columbus Dispatch, Chairman of the Press Club Speakers Committee. Mr. James McIntyre, Director of the Office of Management and Budget. <laughs> Mr. Seth Payne, Chairman of the Board of Governors and from McGraw-Hill World News. <laughs> Ambassador Alonzo McDonald, White House Staff Director. <laughs> Mr. Don Byrne, Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors at the Press Club and Associate Editor of Traffic World. Mr. Stephen Goldfeld, member of the Council of Economic Advisors. And Mr. Arthur Weesey, immediate past president of the Press Club from the Houston Post. <clears throat> On December 12, 1974, former Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter appeared on this platform and announced his candidacy for president of the United States, a scene he repeated later that day in Atlanta. What was an unheralded candidacy soon caught on across America, and our speaker today was elected President of the United States. This is the second time President Carter has reappeared at the Press Club Speaker's Luncheon since taking office, the last being on March 2, 1978, when he announced his civil service reform legislative package. Today, the topic will be economics, a crucial issue in the minds of the electorate as the November 4th election is only three weeks away. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. It was indeed a good omen when, back in 1974, I came here and made a speech and then later became President of the United States. I hope the same thing doesn't happen to Jerry Falwell.
He has a place in the pulpit, just reason. Separ separation of church and state. I consider this to be a very important message. Because three weeks from now, the American people face a critical choice. A choice with historic consequences for America and indeed the entire world. I want the American people to focus hard on those consequences of the election between now and election day. I want every voter to get answers to the important questions about each candidate. Three important questions. How does he intend to build a stronger economy? How does he intend to ensure a more peaceful world? And how does he intend to create a more just society here at home? I'm taking up these questions in a series of nationwide radio broadcasts. I offered a broad answer to the first question on Sunday. I described the kind of economic future our country must build. And this afternoon, I want to give a more extensive report, a more thoughtful report, perhaps, on the same subject. First, I want to describe what is happening to our economy right now. As you know, we and other nations around the world have recently been shocked by OPEC oil prices, which more than doubled in just 12 months. This has been a very difficult and painful period of high inflation and unemployment particularly painful to some Americans who have in their own families suffered most. Fortunately, our nation has been able to withstand this blow. The economic outlook has now brightened. We see the beginnings of recovery. We see a reduction in inflation, an increase in the number of jobs, a decline in the unemployment rate. I'm confident about our future, not simply because the immediate outlook is improving, but because at long last, our country is coming to grips with some of its chronic underlying economic challenges. America's great economic strength is founded on economic freedom. Every day, millions of economic decisions are made in factories, in automobile showrooms, in banks and in brokerage houses, on farms, and around kitchen tables where family budgets are prepared. These millions of choices are not made by official command, but according to private needs and private individual judgments. Nevertheless, the economic impact of government is profound. Government collects taxes, it enacts laws, it issues regulations, it borrows and lends money. Government policies can limit economic opportunities or expand them. If we choose the right policies for the future, we can encourage abundance, opportunity, and stable prices. If we choose the wrong policies for the future, we can accelerate inflation, jeopardize savings and jobs, and discourage investments in the future. No president and no Congress has ever intentionally chosen to be wrong in shaping economic policies for our country. But there have been occasions when the effect of their policies was to worsen the already negative trends that existed in our economy. In the past 15 years, we've had several major inflationary episodes. Each ended in a recession. Each time we were left with a higher underlying level of inflation than we had before. The first of these episodes occurred during the military buildup for the war in Vietnam. We needed to raise adequate revenues during that period when government expenditures, both for defense and for new social programs, were rising. But this failure to do so left a persisting inflationary hangover. Our underlying inflation rate rose from 1% in the first half of the 1960s to over 4% at the beginning of the 1970s. Several, days several years later, in 1972, there was a worldwide grain shortage. Food prices went up sharply. Once again, fiscal excesses added to the inflationary pressures. In 1973 came the Arab oil embargo and a tremendous increase in OPEC petroleum prices. Soon afterwards, our economy suffered the worst recession in 40 years. Once again, the underlying inflation rate failed to drop. Once again, it was ratchet, ratcheted upward, now to 7%. Again in 1979, 
the OPEC countries imposed another huge increase in oil prices on the world economy. Again, the underlying inflation rate was ratcheted upwards, this time to about 9%. We've learned by hard experience the strength of the inflationary forces in our economy and how firmly we must resist the temptation to overstimulate the economy. That is why it is so important to resist the massive across the board tax cuts of the Reagan Kemp Roth proposal. Why we need targeted tax cuts that encourage economic growth, but at the same time hold down inflation. Creating jobs and controlling inflation must go together. Right now, just as we are beginning to bring inflation down, is exactly the wrong time for electioneer proposals that would drive prices up again. We have therefore learned what has caused our current inflation. The failure to raise adequate revenues at a time of greatly increased public spending like in the Vietnam War, natural events such as grain shortages in the early 1970s, overstimulation of the economy sometimes for political purposes, the staggering increases in imported oil prices, and the long decline in our productivity growth in the United States. To overcome inflation, we need to attack its causes directly and at their roots. First, we need to pursue prudent overall fiscal policies. We've made substantial progress in controlling the budget. The rate of real growth in government spending is half what it was when I took office. And the budget deficit has been reduced by more than half as a percentage of the gross national product. We can exercise real fiscal restraint and still maintain a compassionate and a progressive society. We need to eliminate waste. We need to target government programs to areas and citizens who are most in need. We cannot assume that all boats rise with the tide. We need to attract and encourage private investment to join with government in achieving our various economic and social goals. This brings me to one of the central issues of the campaign. Do we want policies that encourage growth without driving up inflation through needed investments in new plant and new equipment? Or do we want to place our emphasis on immediate consumption through a quick, regressive, across the board tax cut? On August the 28th, I proposed a major program to revitalize America's industry. The major part of my proposed tax reductions will go to encourage investment and to create new jobs and investment in our country's economic future. In contrast, this is what Governor Reagan has proposed. First, a large across-the-board tax cut plus a liberalization of business depreciation allowance that by 1983 would cost some $110 billion. Second, a removal of the so-called work test under the Social Security program, costing another six or seven billion dollars annually. Third, a sharp increase in government subsidies for the merchant marine. Fourth, a system of tuition tax credits for those attending private schools, which at even a, mod a modest level would add three to five billion dollars to the budget. Next, an increase in military spending beyond the substantial increases that we've already planned, which would cost more than $20 billion extra a year. And also a substantial repeal of the windfall profits tax that would give at least $10 billion in lost federal revenues back to the oil companies in 1983. These, Governor Reagan's tax and spending proposals, would add $130 billion at least to the 1983 budget deficit. In recent weeks, Governor Reagan has been saying that he can avoid the highly inflationary consequences of these tax and spending programs by cutting other parts of the budget sufficiently to prevent a deficit. By cutting this, by doing what he proposes, he's promised, he's promised to protect Social Security and other entitlement programs. But if all the rest of the federal government, but all the rest of the federal government, and listen to this, 
out of which $130 billion in cuts would have to come, will amount to only $150 billion in 1983. He has not specified, of course, which programs would be cut. I call upon him to do so. For it's clear that the only way he could balance the budget under his program is to eliminate almost all of the federal government except for defense and entitlement programs. On the other hand, it may be that Governor Reagan thought he had to answer to this difficult budgetary problem early this year when he said, and I quote, we could use the increased resources the federal government would get from this tax decrease to rebuild our defense capabilities. I'd like to repeat that. We could use the increased resources from the federal government, which, would, which it would get from this tax decrease to rebuild our defense capabilities. As I said earlier, I leave the assessment of the Reagan Kemp Roth proposal to the good sense and judgment of the American people. I propose that we reject quick inflationary tax cuts that pile up federal deficits and erode the value of the money of our country. I propose instead that we rely on the same values and the same common sense that built our country in the first place. I propose that we encourage capital investment in new plant and equipment, the investments we need to increase worker productivity. If living standards are to rise, productivity must grow. There's no way around this. It's an economic fact of life. During the 1950s and 1960s, productivity grew at an average of about 3% per year. During the 1970s, productivity growth began to slow down. And today, it has hardly growing at all. There are many theories for this decline in productivity growth, but there's one sure prescription for it. Providing American workers with a growing stock of modern plant and equipment. Our workers can continue to be the most productive in the world if given the proper tools. To do that, government must encourage investment. We must make sure that American research and development does not lag behind. We must provide the kind of tax incentives that will help to modernize the nation's industries. I've listed two elements in the administration's economic program, fiscal prudence and encouraging productivity. A third, the most important of all, concerns energy. During the 1970s, the price of oil rose by more than tenfold. We will pay about $85 billion to import oil this year, 30 times what we paid just 10 years ago. Only in the last two years have we really launched the right kind of energy programs with new legislation passed by Congress to stimulate new production of oil, coal, and natural gas, to encourage conservation in homes and in businesses, to develop synthetic fuels from our coal and oil shale resources, to make nuclear energy production safer and more reliable, and to tap the power of the sun. As a result of these and other energy measures, we've cut our foreign oil consumption by two million barrels per day, almost 25% since I took office. No other country can match that record. We have loosened but not yet broken the grip of foreign oil dependency. Those who ignore this challenge, those who discount conservation, those who believe we can leave the energy challenge to the oil companies alone have failed to grasp what may well be the central challenge of our time. The fourth element of our energy economic policy is aimed at putting people back to work and creating jobs for the millions of men and women who will be entering the workforce in the 1980s. To accomplish our goal of full employment, we need to do several things. We need to insist, first of all, on fair rules of trade with other nations in every product. Our program to help the American steel industry will help to achieve this kind of fairness. We are awaiting a decision on the internet from the International Trade Commission to determine if action should be taken with regard to Japanese automobiles. We must not embark on the kind of trade war that wrecked the world economy of the 1930s. The way to full employment does not lie in escalating an already persistent inflation. It lies in the right kind of tax incentives. It lies in measures that bring about investment in modern plant and equipment. It lies in controlling inflation. 
so that industry can plan for the future with confidence, and so that interest rates can be brought down within the reach of home buyers and consumers. It lies in stimulating competition, deregulating the airlines, the railroads, the financial institutions, energy, the truck lines, and communication industries, just as we have done. Creating jobs is what my economic revitalization program is all about. I propose that in areas suffering high unemployment and a declining industrial base, an additional tax credit be allowed for qualifying investments. Also, that depreciation schedules be simplified and depreciation rates accelerated, and that investment tax credits be made partially refundable, which will help new companies and those hit by cyclical downturns which, whose profits are not high enough to pay, pay high rates of taxation. I've also recognized that economic change sometimes requires difficult adjustment. I propose tax incentives and the establishment of an industrial development authority to channel public and private resources to help industries and communities adjust to inevitable economic change. All these proposals have one thing in common. They put people to work in real jobs without triggering higher prices. Inflation is beginning to decline. We need to maintain that trend. To make further progress, we will consult with business, labor, and other groups about how to improve our voluntary wage and price policies. We also need to work together to design future tax reductions that help to moderate the wage and price spiral. Government can help to build an exciting and healthy economic future for our country. But if we are to succeed, it cannot be because of government alone, or business alone, or labor alone. It must be because government, business, labor, and the public work together. Our programs to meet the energy challenge and to modernize American industry can set the stage for American economic renaissance. If we follow through with these steps, we can have a future of modern plants, a future where American coal and shale and farm products fuel American cars and trucks, a future where modern rail beds and ports make American coal a powerful rival of OPEC oil, a future of full employment of American men and women, working to modernize American industry and to create whole new American industries. I believe that if the American people understand the nature of their choice in this absolutely crucial campaign issue and the consequences of the choice they will make, they will choose the right course for the economic future of this country. Americans prove that by facing up to the reality of our energy problem and reversing several decades of increasing dependence on foreign oil. That achievement gives us a foundation now on which to realize the hopes and dreams and expectations which I've just outlined to you. If we fight for economic progress as hard as we've been fighting for America's energy security, then I am confident that we can build a future of full employment, stable prices, rising exports, a more modern competitive industry, and a stronger, more prosperous, and a more productive America. That is my goal. It's a goal that I intend to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll have a few questions. The first question, you have complained that interest rates are too high. Do you think the Federal Reserve should intervene in the market and drive down interest rates? No, I don't. I think we have a proper balance now between the private sector, the financial community, and the economic and commercial community. On the one hand, the Federal Reserve Board, which is independent, on the second hand, the Congress, independently from me, and I as executive of a country. I make proposals, make decisions on regulations, change priorities in the budget, emphasize certain aspects of American life to the public through my statements and actions. The Congress makes decisions on uh, budget levels and passes legislation con concerning tax programs. The Federal Reserve observes all these matters and makes their decisions. The financial community reacts. I think it's a good, sound system. 
I do, however, believe that recently the financial institutions, the banks, have overreacted, and I believe that at this time the interest rates are too high compared with the economic circumstances that prevail. It's my own judgment. I believe it's sound, and I hope that the uh, sound of my voice and the financial institutions will uh, prevail and the interest rates will come down where they ought to be. But I don't want to intercede artificially as a president or through an administration to uh, directly affect interest rates. Mr. President, along economic lines, a lot of people think grocery prices are too high, but farmers feel their returns for their products are too low. What do you think? And what does Mrs. Carter think? <laughs> My wife's enough of a politician to realize that there are two sides to this very important issue. <laughs> I inherited, when I came into office, a time of uh, economic deprivation and uncertainty among farmers with an excessive intrusion of the federal government into their affairs and a rapid uh, changing cycle of uh, supply and demand and therefore wild rises quite often in uh, farm or agricultural prices uh, after the grain or other products had left the farmer. We approached this in several ways, the most important aspect of which was to build up substantial storage of farm products on the farms. We encouraged farmers to keep their products under their own control. We arranged government programs to assist them and put literally hundreds of millions of dollars on loans, which the farmers are repaying on a timely basis, to build storage for them to hold their grain. This means that there's a much more stable supply of grain now if we have an excess uh, harvest above the average or expected level, then that grain goes into the farmer held reserve. If we have a shortage in our country on a worldwide basis, then the farmers can take grain out of their preserve at a carefully prescribed uh, price in advance and market it uh, to keep our country sound and the world supply sound. I think this has done a good job in stabilizing prices. We have had reasonable gross income for farmers and reasonable net income for farmers. Same time since I've been in office, both gross and net income for farmers has, been, has increased more than in any administration in history. One of the reasons for this has not been an excessive burden on the American consumer, who still get food at a lower level compared to their other income and compared to other people than anybody on earth, but because we have escalated so greatly the exporting of American agricultural products. We set a world's record on exports of agricultural products in 1977. We broke that record in 78. We broke it again in 79. And this year, in spite of the interruption of some of our sales to the Soviet Union, we've had the greatest increase in history, increasing exports by $8 billion this year alone, up to a level of $40 billion for American exported agricultural products. You might be interested in knowing that this year we'll sell Mexico, 10 million tons of American grain. I tried the best I could to, to stabilize American farm prices in spite of the interruption of sale of some grain to the Soviet Union and at the same time to open up in the rest of the world more permanent customers for American agricultural products. In the long historic perspective, our biggest single strategic asset of a peaceful nature is the productivity of our land. It's much more important on a historical scale than OPEC oil, for instance. And so I believe we've got a, a very sound farm economy now, stable prices compared to what they were, good bargains for American consumers, and I would guess that in the future these prices would increase only at very moderate rates compatible with uh, market pressures that are much less fluctuating than they were before. President, in criticizing Governor Reagan, you have used outdated statements he has since repudiated, like his 1966 comments about making Social Security voluntary. Is this fair campaigning since just in the past four years, you have changed your position on a number of major issues, like your 1976 campaign pledge to cut defense spending, your former opposition to decontrol de of oil prices, and your one-time opposition to any form of national health insurance? 
When we quote uh, Governor Reagan on these matters of interest to the American people, we, we always uh, make a point to give to the news media the, the time and the place of the statement which he has made. Uh, recently, in the last few days, I understand, he has said that he has not changed his positions, that his positions are consistent with what they've been for the last 20 years. Sometimes they are in conflict, but I think the basic underlying philosophy is there. When he says, for instance, that the minimum wage has caused more damage than anything since the Great Depression, that's the expression of a philosophy about working people that's still pervasive, I think, in his, in his own mind and also in the, in the platform of his party. When he says that unemployment compensation is a prepaid vacation for freeloaders, to me, that's a statement that still prevails, although he may have said it uh, a while ago. When he took on his role as the nationwide opponent or spokesman against Medicare and travel this country speaking against Medicare, he said that this would lead to the government's intrusion into private affairs so that a government would later tell a young man or woman where they could go to work or where a family could live. Recently, he repeated a similar statement even this year. And his uh, most disturbing statement was one recently made about withdrawing SALT II treaty from the Senate, speculating on the advisability of a so-called nuclear arms race to induce the Soviets to be more forthcoming in SALT negotiations and saying that he was in effect playing a card against the Soviet Union. This kind of talk to me, made quite recently within the last couple of weeks, is extremely dangerous. And, and re the repeated nature of some of his statements when he was either a candidate for president or had the hopes of being a president, th the pattern is still there. Uh, for instance, all of us who serve in the Oval Office recognize the uh, sensitivity of the decisions we make, the, the dealing with uh, potential crises which might, if mishandled, become real crises and affect the life of everyone in this nation and perhaps the world. My predecessors in office, Republican and Democrat, and I, deal constantly with a series of troubled spots in the world. And we try to manage those potential problems in a diplomatic way, without the use of military force. Repeatedly, there's a pattern of Governor Reagan's calling for the injection of military forces by the United States into those troubled spots in the world, in Ecuador, or Cuba, in Cyprus, Pakistan, uh, North Korea, the Middle East, Angola, Rhodesia, just to name a few. This kind of uh, inclination to me, although some of those statements were made recently, some of them longer ago, the pattern is what causes me concern. So we are trying to be extremely accurate in quoting Governor Reagan precisely and also putting the right tone and not misinterpreting what he says and giving the dates without misleading the American people about the timeliness of them. Mr. President, uh, before asking you one final question, I would like to uh, present you with a National Press Club Certificate of Appreciation for being here and also a uh, Press Club jacket, which we hope you will wear. Final question, uh, Mr. President, your opponents expect from you an October surprise, a political trick-or-treat. <laughs> to put their minds to rest, will you tell us what the surprise is or do we have to wait? <laughs> First of all, let me say that I'll treasure this certificate the rest of my life. <laughs> and, uh... Thank you very much. It's not possible for a president to contrive a, a significant surprise. We deal in the Oval Office with uh, questions of uh, profound importance and difficulty. We try without delay to solve any problems that uh, arise. I think every president who served there has tried to do the best he could to meet the needs of our country. Uh, it would be very pleasant for me if we could come up with a zero inflation rate or 
a zero unemployment rate or a boon to our economy that was uh, significant, or if the Japanese would say they would never ship any more cars to our country unless they were given away free or something like that. <laughs> but you know, that's the kind of hopes that, uh, that always exist. I think it would be a, a, a bad thing if I tried to delay uh, good news or to conceal bad news to create some sort of surprise just to, just to orient the uh, election. So you need not expect uh, any such surprise between now and November. If it's a surprise to you, I guarantee you it will always so be a surprise to the president. <laughs> Thank you. I've enjoyed being with you.